Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Denver Regional Council of Governments Transportation Advisory Committee meeting known as the TAC. I am Kim Orman and I'm the chair and I call this or to order the December 20th, 2021 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. Dr. Cog uses a digital platform, Zoom, members and alternates you have the ability to mute and unmute yourselves and share your webcam. We ask that you use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak to an agenda item, question or and comments. Please make sure that your type name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. At this time, Cam will list um, um, all, all uh, members and, and uh, alternates. Uh, if for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added um, for the record. Cam? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance for members and alternates, I currently see uh, Kent Mormon, Alex Hyde Wright, Art Griffith, Brooke Svoboda, Bryce Hammerton, Rick Pilgrim, Carson Priest, Chris Hudson, Chris Quinn, Danny Herman, Eugene Howard, Fred Rollenhagen, George Hollenkoff, Ian Rao, Jeff Dakenbring, Justin Bagley, uh, Ken Johnson, uh, Kristen Kenyon, Kevin Ash, Mac Callison, Maria DeAndre, Mike Whitaker, Phil Greenwald, Rob Zuccaro, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, Steve Durian, and Walter Wirt. Uh, those are all the members and alternates I see at this time, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And we do have a quorum. The, um, at this time, we'll now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing the star nine, and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you, and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will partake in the discussion regarding each item. With that, um, please raise your hand if you have public comment. S seeing none, uh, we'll move on to our next item. And um, that item is the uh, uh, um, TAC meeting summary. Are there any um, discussion, corrections, or questions of the uh, um, November 15th, 2021 um, TAC meeting summary? If so, please raise your hand. Seeing none, um, they stand approved as submitted. Next, we'll move on to our action items. And the first item on the list will be by Todd Cottrell, our senior planner in, um, at Dr. Cog on discussion of the transportation improvement program, fiscal year 2021 project delays report. Todd. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so uh, before you is a report on the FY21 project delays. Um, so the adopted TIP policy outlines uh, expectations for the initiation of project phases, uh, certainly including how to address these delays if they happen. So regardless of the reasons, these delays do tie up the limited funding available to Dr. Cog to allocate. Um, so in accordance with the policy, um, at the end of federal fiscal year 21 in October, um, Dr. Cog asked both CDOT and RTD 
to review the status of those projects that had the FY21 funding. And after confirming the, what those project statuses were, um, Dr. Cogstaff contacted the sponsors with project phases that were not initiated and therefore delayed uh, to find out the reasons for the reasons their identified FY21 phases were not initiated, um, to discover the current status of their project, and to assist them to develop a plan to initiate those project phases that were delayed. Um, so this attached report summarizes the project phases that certainly were delayed as of October 1st. Um, overall, the report states that 28 projects are first year delayed, uh, in which one is already initiated and therefore is no longer delayed. Uh, a motion to approve staff's recommendations this afternoon would allow them to continue. To avoid a second year delay, all these project phases identified in this report must initiate their delayed phase by October for, I'm sorry, July 1st of next year. So just a couple quick observations concerning these delays. Um, so the number of delayed project phases is still approximately double versus a, a typical normal year. Um, and so when looking at the delays um, as to why, um, there seems to be a fairly equal distribution um, for those reasons, including um, right away and or utility issues, um, a delay in the IGA process. Uh, number three, a lack of or a under development of any pre-planning activities or understanding of the federal aid process, um, staffing losses, um, and then certainly finally COVID-19 is still impacting some of these projects. Um, so at this time, that kind of concludes the information that I have uh, regarding this report. Uh, I'd be happy to take any comments or questions you may have. Uh, if not, the motion before you is to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the actions proposed by Dr. Cog staff regarding the TIP project delays for fiscal year 20, 2021. Thank you, Todd. Uh, Brian Weimer, I see you've uh, raised your hand. Go ahead, Brian. Yes, thanks. Um, since you've mentioned that many of the delays are utility related, um, what type of approach is Dr. Cog looking at taking to see if we can um, eliminate some of those delays, i.e. working with the various utility providers. I can think of one in uh, uh, for sure, but I won't name them at this point, but I think there's uh, consistency around the metro area as to those delays. And how might we be able to um, come up with a process that starts eliminating those delays that a lot of times are outside the control of the local jurisdiction. Right. No, thank you for the question, Brian. Um, I think the first thing to really stress is there are project delay elements that are out of the control of a lot of, of um, a lot of us. So COVID-19 certainly being one of them, staffing issues where you might have had certain staff available uh, when you applied, but you do not at this time. Uh, we've always included natural disasters, flooding, for example, is the most common in this in this area. But certainly, I think working with outside utility companies certainly falls into that realm. Uh, railroad companies are another perfect example where there are things that, as local agencies, we can't necessarily control. So um, I, th I think really it's twofold. One is um, to understand fully what may be necessary uh, during the, that pre-development phase of your project. Um, we certainly will be stressing that during the upcoming calls, uh, certainly as part of the application process. Um, but another is, um, I think, working potentially through CDOT to really see if there's discussions to be had, um, I, I shouldn't say with CDOT, but in conjunction with CDOT, to some of these utility companies to understand so that they can understand sort of what the local agency process is and where we can all you know find a common common ground and, and understanding of when their assistance may be necessary to help out for the greater good of the project. Yeah, I can agree with that. Um, and we've tried those sort of things, but 
Um, it's really getting a full commitment from those utility companies that is creating issues. Um, I can think of a project that's not on this list, but um, created the del delays for us in the past where we were working with the utility company some two years in advance for relocations and it wasn't happening and still dealing with it today as the project's in construction. And so that's a that's a huge challenge. And I think we need to, if <laughs> I, we can talk about all this planning and stuff, but reality is if unless we change something, we're still going to get what we're getting. So what can we do? Um, kind of from a local level, maybe as a group to initiate change. And that would be that would be my suggestion. Be interested in okay. what others have experienced. Yes, certainly if there's others out there who have any ideas, uh, we're all ears. Um, Mike Whitaker with Lakewood. Yeah, we've got a project on Wadsworth that we've been working with uh, Excel on. And one of the dilemmas you end up with is they have a policy that your final grade has to be within six inches before they'll underground power lines. And so how do we get through and do embankment projects where we're going to regrade, you know, a hillside so that they'll come in and redo their undergrounding. So we almost need to think as an agency, you know, you're going to have a dirt work component of your project early on to get it close to grade. And then the utilities are going to come in and relocate and, I mean, it's becoming more common. So anytime you have dirt work, I think you're going to be set up for a multi-phase project. And somehow we got to think of that when we're putting the applications in. Thank you, Mike. Um, Brian, you still had your hand up. Did you have any additional? I guess not. Okay. Um, we've, um, are looking for a motion um, that would be to move to recommend the, rec the Regional Transportation Committee actions proposed by the Dr. Cog staff regarding the TIP project delays for fiscal year 2021. I think what Brian brought up uh, just uh, what might be something that the TIP or the TAC would like to look at further in the next year. Uh, Todd, something to think about. Certainly. If someone would like to make a motion, please raise your hand. Sarah Grant. Thank you, Chair. I move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee actions proposed by Dr. Cog staff regarding the TIP project delays for fiscal year 21. Thank you, sir. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second, Weimer. Thank you, Brian. So it's been moved and seconded. All those in uh, favor say aye. 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 Okay. All opposed, no. Not hearing any, any abstentions. And a uh, motion passes unanimously. Our next uh, item, action item, is discussion on policy and process for selecting and programming transportation improvement program projects for fiscal year 2022 through fiscal year 2027. And Todd has this uh, item also. Todd? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Get the item up here. All right, so I would certainly like to thank everyone for for their hard work um, since earlier this year. Uh, we've been discussing elements of the policy, um, elements of the TIP applications, and your sort of recommendations, hopefully after this agenda item is complete, will advance both of those documents and advance this process so that we're order, you know, able to issue a call for projects here starting on January 24th, um, you know, a, approximately a month from now. So. Um, thank you in advance for all the hard work. And again, 
we're not done yet. We're going to keep going uh, into what is going to be a marathon four calls uh, back to back to back to back essentially. Um, but with that saying, I will uh, I will say this presentation is there's elements that you have probably seen before, whether it's uh, through TAC or other committees or even maybe your forums, but uh, there really is no other good way to put it all together into one picture. Um, so I will try to bring this information to you uh, um, as, as, as best that we can. So we're here to cover five items, uh, TIP policy documents, uh, funding programs, uh, the actual programming process and what that looks like in a timeline, the applications, and then certainly what funding is available. Um, so on Thursday afternoon, um, following the board discussion from last Wednesday night, um, Dr. Cox staff heard discussion um, regarding the draft policy document and, and, and the TIP applications. Um, at that time, we issued an addendum to correct a couple items within the policy document and the applications. Um, so at a certain, at a couple places throughout this presentation, we'll point out where in those documents it's referencing, and uh, hopefully we can include that as part of the action here this afternoon. Um, so just again, kind of taking the high level approach on what the TIP policy is, uh, it certainly establishes the rules for the process. It is telling us in setting up for these call for projects in what, um, this document will look like once it's actually completed. Um, one overall change um, that sort of governs this entire document is a change to it where we remove the actual TIP years. We've changed the name. Uh, we'll now refer to it as policies for TIP program development, um, though almost with 100% certainty, you'll continue to hear it referred to as a TIP policy document. Um, we will continue to allow um, for amendments, whenever those are necessary, we'll seek both um, the technical and the policy level changes to this document, certainly most likely when those occur before future calls for projects happens. Um, but the overall uh, governance of this document is once we amend it, um, or once we adopt it, we will keep this document going. And then hopefully every four years, we will not need to amend I'm sorry, we'll not need to adopt a brand new document. We'll just keep amending this document, the policies for TIP program development um, in perpetuity or until a, a complete revision is needed. But just some very high level document edits. Uh, we've edited, uh, I've made changes to the capital project eligi eligibility, essentially linking those projects that are contained in the current uh, 2050 regional transportation plan and when and where those may be eligible for TIP funding. Um, we've edited and changed the set-aside programs. Uh, we've replaced those TIP focus areas with the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan Project and Program Investment Priorities. Uh, that is most important, I think, when we get to the applications, uh, which we'll get to a little bit later here. Um, within the regional share, so in addition to editing um, and making changes to the eligibility requirements, uh, we have also changed the minimum match requirements from 50% um, down to a proposed 20%. Within the sub-regional share, um, there's changes to the funding targets. So those targets are uh, the targeted percentage to each of your individual sub-regions. Uh, we've also changed uh, and made changes to the eligibility requirements within the sub-regional share. And again, within the forum, simply just saying that if you are going to take a vote within one of your forums, that must be actually during a meeting, whether in person or virtual, uh, versus outside of a meeting setting. Uh, so this is when one of the first addendums comes to. Uh, this is to the first paragraph within chapter three, section A.2. Um, and this was a sentence that was essentially trying to get at if, if any additional programming needs to take place outside of the regional or sub-regional calls for projects or that waiting list process, um, that we will keep the board informed of that process of what's going on um, and even possibly seeking action for their approval. Again, depending on the item, if that item is contained in the policy already, we would not need to seek their um, seek action from them, but certainly keep board in the loop if there's anything that needs to take place um, outside of those calls. Uh, so now we can dive into the funding programs. Um, so there's two main sources of where our funding is coming from. 
Um, the first being the state through the, um, the Multimodal Options Fund program. Um, so this was an extension of the program from the last tip. So even though there was a slight name change and the eligibility was expanded, that 50% match was retained. Um, one key item about the Multimodal Options Fund program for starting in FY22 and continuing through 27 and beyond um, is the FY22 funds only um, have now been federalized by adding the federal ARPA funds. Um, so in addition to having a lot more of these funds in FY22 as compared to some of the other years, um, there are some obligation deadlines, meaning if you do receive these FY22 funds, uh, you must obligate those funds by the end of, of um, 2024 and have those 100% completely expended all your billings wrapped up with CDOT or RTD by the end of 2026. Um, the second major source of the funding uh, for this TIP process is gonna be the new federal infrastructure bill, which was just passed la or signed last month. Um, so this does contain the traditional sources that we've had, uh, including the CMAC program, um, TA or transportation alternatives, um, the surface transportation block grants or STBG, in one new program called the Carbon Reduction Program, which we believe will act very similar to the CMAC program. Um, so at this time, uh, we only have the, the, uh, the statewide apportionments um, that has not been broken farther down into the MPO level, um, though we are fairly confident to say that, um, you know, approximately 25 to 30% increase in funding over the FAST Act. So how does this all look when we put this together in terms of the actual programming of the projects? Um, so two things overarching to the entire process is going to be the waitlist process, which we are currently um, going through at this time. Um, in addition to that, we will also program these future calls using two essential tr tracks or applications. Um, this is really to assist in um, the match itself, since the multimodal options fund um, requires a 50% match, while the, re the remaining funding sources will only require a 20% Dr. Cog match. Um, in addition to that, there is the 2050 RTP amendment, which Jacob will describe here in a little bit. We certainly would like to avoid in any interactions with that if all possible. So the first track or application is the STBG, again, Surface Transportation Block Grant, um, process. Um, we will use that. Um, I would look at that very similar to how we've had the normal process. We will use those funds only um, and be eligible for projects that are under are eligible under that program. The second track or application is for air quality and multimodal projects. Um, this is where we will combine a multitude of funding sources um, to keep that local match down um, and certainly the project selected from um, this air quality and multimodal will have those project elements. Um, in terms of the call sequence, the first two calls are going to be for um, the current 22 to 25 tip. So we will conduct a regional and then a sub-regional call. Uh, this will be for that air quality and multimodal track only, again, to concentrate and to avoid the RTP amendment. Um, this will kick off um, within the next month, January 24th. Um, once we get through both the regional and the sub-regional call, um, that will probably take us until September of next year. We will then amend the current TIP. Uh, before that process has even been completed, we will immediately start on the next two calls, going through the regional and sub-regional calls for the development of the new TIP, covering uh, federal fiscal years 24 through 27. These last two calls for the new TIP will use both of these tracks. Uh, and again, like I said, we will begin that process process in September of next year, um, conclude it in April, uh, and then we will work to adopt a new TIP by the August of 2023. This is simply how that schedule may look if we, uh, you know, showed it in a different way. Uh, but again, we're we're going to start work here uh, at the end of January, and it, it's going to be a long year and a half. Um, just to chug through and uh, you know get all these projects selected. So taking a look at the actual applications, uh, it is divided into four sections. Uh, the first being the regional impact of the of the project. Um, we're essentially looking at 
set up very similar to how the previous application was. So we're looking at, you know, what is the, uh, what, how important is your project? Does it solve a regional or a sub-regional um, problem? How well does it connect to MetroVision? Um, the proposed weighting is 30%. Uh, for section B is the RTP priorities with a proposed weight of 50%. Um, again, this is looking at questions that would align to safety, active transportation, air quality, multimodal uh, mobility, freight, and transit. Um, the last two sections carry a proposed weighting of 10% uh, private project leveraging, essentially how much match is being provided. Uh, in the final section is a new section called project readiness. Uh, we're looking for those types of things that you would do even before you're filling out your application, um, trying to screen for some of those pitfalls um, so that hopefully those pitfalls are actually avoided. Uh, section D for project readiness is where I'd like to mention the second addendum um, that was um, emailed out on Thursday. Uh, it adds two questions to this section. Um, the first being, uh, talking about uh, is there staff available from your local agency to work on this project? And second, are they knowledgeable with the federal aid process? So a little bit more about the applications and some other items. Um, each question on this application is scored from zero to five, um, especially within those first two sections. There is all your responses will be narrative. Some of those do require a quantitative response um, included within that narrative. We are developing a data tool um, that will that will sort of go live here on uh, next month. That should be able to assist you in some of that um, data collection. Cost estimates in year of expenditure dollars will be required to be provided with your application packet. Um, and again, the last item is something you've heard me kind of preach on probably for a long time now, but certainly feel that the more time you spend now on your project development, that will only serve to benefit, benefit you later on in the process. All right, anticipated funding. So how much funding are we anticipating over, over this 22 to 27 time period? At this time, uh, approximately $487 million dollars. Though I certainly would like to point out that the FY22 funds um, that will be lowered uh, in accordance to uh, connected to the waitlist process that is ongoing. Um, so we will update that as soon as the waitlist project has been concluded. When we break that down into the first two calls, again, for the current 22 to 25 tip, um, expected to be approximately $43 million and $174 million for the subregional call. Looking at the final two calls, calls three and four, again, for the 24 to 27 tip, um, projected about you know, approximately $54 million available for the regional call, for the subregional call, approximately $215 million. Um, again, when or before we release each call for projects, we certainly will update these numbers um, it is certainly possible if funding sources are not used for one call, it may roll over to another call. Um, so we'll, again, we will certainly keep everyone in the loop on exactly what we project the uh, funding available is for each call uh, and, and as we you know, go along through the process. Um, so just a few observations to conclude all of this information. Um, certainly when we look at these first two calls, um, since by the time it's going to be, you know, almost the beginning of federal fiscal year 23, by the time we amend the current tip, um, we are essentially going to be programming these projects into three years, 23 through 25. Um, so from our staff to yours, we hope that most of these projects seem to be what somewhat smaller, maybe if not smaller, maybe a little less complicated, um, certainly get in and get out as soon as possible. And I think the majority of that recommendation is because most likely these projects are going to have those FY22 multimodal options fund and has those deadlines. So it will be even more important um, to, to, you know, work on those pre-development activities as much as possible. Um, and then also keeping in mind these first two calls, um, since it is the air quality and multimodal application, uh, roadway capacity, roadway reconstruction, and bridge projects, we are not going to be eligible for these calls. 
essentially all projects selected in these first two calls must improve congestion and or air quality. When looking at these final calls, calls in three and four for the 24 to 27 tip, um, a great majority of that funding is in those last two years. Uh, so again, just something to keep in mind when you're putting together your projects. Um, and then certainly for any, any number of these calls, um, just be open to flexibilities. And I think we say that from the perspective of we are going to be amending the current tip first and then immediately working into development of the new tip. Um, just because they're so close together um, and there are so many funding types in play, uh, it is possible we may eventually have to move some funding around to meet the needs of those future projects. Um, time will certainly tell, but I think just because there's so much going on um, all in one year and a half year time period, um, we would just ask for everyone to sort of keep in mind, keep an open mind and be as flexible as, as possible. So with that, be happy to take any comments or questions. Again, that's a lot of information thrown out there, um, but the requested action before you would be to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft uh, policies for TIP program development document and the draft air quality multimodal and STBG TIP applications. Thank you, Todd. Um, I see Phil Greenwald has his hand up, so Phil, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Todd. Thanks uh, so much for that uh, presentation. Appreciate all the information. It's a lot, lot to digest here, but um, just wanted to check in with you real quick. It seemed like the last slide before this one kind of indicated that um, that's just the air quality and multimodal um, applications, the no roadway capacity reconstruction, as that could include the, we've talked a lot about up here about doing bat lanes as part of reconstruction. Is that how does that fit in with, I guess, what we're talking about here? Uh, right, and I, I'll confirm with Jacob just because it does touch the RTP, but uh, pretty confident to say that the bat lanes would still be eligible. Um, and again, Jacob or Ron, please correct me on that. I think that's right, Todd. Okay. That, that was always my working assumption too. So I just wanted to be sure saying that publicly. I just saw no roadway this capacity. Is Ron, bat, 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 bat lanes are a, a transit capacity project eligible under either multimodal options fund or air or CMAC funding. The the projects that aren't eligible are um, automobile capacity projects. Great. Thank you for that clarification. Thank you, Phil. Art Griffith, you're I have you up next. Go ahead, Art. Yeah. Hey, Todd, could you go back to the money associated with the calls one and two, just as a breakdown? Um, mm -hmm. And um, the top part uh, is all part of the regional call? Correct. Yes, okay. this top box is the projected funding available for the call that will start this January 24th. And I, yeah, I will and say there is a note with that, that this FY22 funding um, will most likely be reduced just because of the waitlist process. Um, the exact amount unknown at this time, uh, it won't be a substantial amount, but that amount will drift down slightly. And that could apply also for the, the sub-regions too, if their waitlist projects move up, right? Correct, because the waitlist yeah. process takes into account the, the total of the FY22 funds that are available. Um, and that that process is different than both calls one and two. Um, so it would come off the total. Um, so the that would reduce the total amount of FY22 funds that are available. This split takes into account, um, and let me go back, this $87.6 million. So that 86.7 will be reduced and therefore it does reduce the split between the regional and sub-regional also. And just to make sure I understand this right, um, this MMOF percentage, like so 99 million in change, 
that might filter down to 18 million in Douglas County. That that requires a 50-50 match. The multimodal funds themselves, yes, require a 50% match. But what we are hoping through this process, and again, looking at the projects that are submitted, is to combine the funding sources together to reduce the requirement for local agencies to provide that 50% match in hopes that yeah. we could, again, just work to combine the funding sources to reduce that match down to 20%. And so when we pursue a project that um, that may may be able to reduce the match, do we identify that or do, or do you identify that for us? <laughs> We, Who's doing no, the heavy lifting no. on that? Right. As Dr. Cog staff, we will certainly do the heavy lifting on that part. Um, I believe the only place in the application for the air quality and multimodal application is if you would solely like the multimodal options fund at 50%. And therefore, if you're looking at FY23, 24, or 25 funds, um, if you would like that project to be a state project versus a federal project, that is your prerogative. And you certainly, I believe we have a check box in the table that says we would, we would like this, we would like to keep this project to be non-federalized and therefore um, we would put forth 50, a 50% a 50 match for that. Okay, I'll put down my hand, but it looks like Ron might add something. Ron, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to just to supplement Todd's answer a little bit, there's there's probably not much advantage to a local government sponsor to request all um, multimodal options fund money in this call, particularly um, the early years, because most of that money is federal money, anyways. It's it's American Rescue Plan Act money that the state legislature used to front end the multimodal options fund program. So your project's gonna be federalized anyways. And um, so um, how, why we have proposed um, in this policy to come to, to split out sort of the air quality multimodal program from the STBG program is so that, and you'll see it on the application, the minimum local sponsor match proposal for the air quality multimodal application is 10% of the project cost because the intent is we'll use half we'll, we'll fund half the project cost with the multiple options fund money 40% of the cost with CMAC TA carbon reduction program or some combination of those and then the the local match for those federal funds to fully fund the project Thank you, Ron. Rick Pilgrim, you're up next. You're muted. Uh, I'm having trouble hearing you, Rick. Does everyone else have trouble? Todd? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Rick. I don't think we're able to understand a single word of that. <laughs> yeah. Is that better? There we yes. go. There we go. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, it's only been two years trying to figure these out. So, uh, but, but, so, Todd, thanks for the overview. Uh, um, What's your perspective about uh, some continuing changes to the TIP process? And the reason I ask that, uh, you, you point out here, maybe not this slide, but one of them, that uh, 20 to 30 percent of uh, this future funding is coming through the JOBS Act. Uh, it, it seems like we don't yet know what the greenhouse gas requirement is going to be either from the Jobs Act, and, and Jacob's going to talk about it a little bit later uh, at a state level. So, you know, there's, there's those kinds of things. Um, I thought there was an equity requirement 
that was going to follow the Jobs Act dollars. Uh, and, and I know we've got to get something in place right now, but could you just kind of look ahead and, and, uh, and suggest if there will be continuing changes to this process, or do you think we're in pretty good shape for the next cycle and we'll deal with that uh, when all that clarifies for the following cycle? It is a very difficult answer to give. And I say that because there has not been a lot of rulings or policies that really take, that, are, that were really given at the time for the new federal bill. Um, those will come out eventually. Um, from what we understand, there is a basic carryover from the FAST Act of these federal programs. Obviously, the carbon reduction program is new. Um, there certainly is the ability for us to make edits on the fly, if you want to call it that, where once we get to, um, or I should say, before we get to the calls for projects covering 24 to 27, if there is something that sort of comes out, now whether that be through the greenhouse gas process or some other federal rulings or laws that may come into play. Um, I think we certainly could pivot if necessary, um, but it's at least I think from our perspective, it's very difficult to say if we will need to, and if we did, what that would be. It, it's just, yeah. again, I echo exactly what you said. We're putting things down right now, I think just to get the process started. And we anticipate that we're going to be set up for future success. And that's, you know, that's where we're, we're heading. We just don't know. Um, we can't base that necessarily on things that we don't understand that may happen in the near future. Well, <clears throat> I, I think just an awareness and uh, being ready for those changes so that we can, you know, uh, we can adjust program in those out years. Certainly. So, thank you. Ron, it looked like you wanted to respond to that. Yeah, um, just just would would add, Rick, that there's 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 no equity requirement in the in the federal infrastructure bill. Um, there's an emphasis on on equity considerations for the competitive discretionary grant programs. Um, once once U.S. Department of Transportation starts to issue NOFOs for those competitive grant programs, but we're talking about um, allocating funds that are that are sub-allocated through Dr. Cog by formula. Um, so those funds that flow through Dr. Cog by formula um, from the federal government through the state to Dr. Cog. And there were not significant um, eligibility or um, changes or requirements um, for CMAC TA. Um, the carbon reduction program has very similar project eligibilities to the CMAC, to the CMAC program. So I think. I, I don't anticipate any significant changes there. As far as the state greenhouse gas rule, um, just adopted by the commission last week, which will go into effect in the middle of February, that's the whole reason that we are doing this air quality multimodal call only during, during this coming year, during the, the first three quarters or so of 2022 is to give us time to reevaluate the regional transportation plan in the context of that rule, um, because the eligibilities for these programs are the types of projects that will only help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions anyways. And so, and that's why we're sort of deferring a call using the surface transportation block grant funds, which are the most, um, the most um, flexible of the federal funds that we deal with that can fund projects that could potentially have um, impacts on greenhouse gas emissions that we need to understand within the context of the plan. So I, I think I think this whole process we've intentionally set up as, in a way to, to make sure that we um, are positioned to respond to any potential changes from the greenhouse gas rule. Uh, the that's a great approach, Ron and, and Todd. Thanks. That appreciate the insight. Thank you, Rick, for the question, and Ron and Todd for the response on that. Uh, Alex Hydright, you're up next. Yes. 
Thank you for the presentation and all the information. Um, I had a couple, I guess, ranging from minor to maybe a little more significant suggestions for revisions to the TIP policy. Wondering if I should just go through those one by one. Uh, certainly. Um, and I apologize, I'm going to be referring to the page number of the TAC agenda packet, not of the presentation. Um, but on page 32, the it's labeled as number three, and I'm sorry, I forget which section, the air quality commitments. Um, this is where we have a sentence in there about the TIP must also comply with the outcomes of uh, House Bill 1261 and Senate Bill 260. Um, wondering now that the greenhouse gas planning standard has passed, if we could maybe strengthen the language that refers to that instead of just saying comply with any outcomes, which kind of leaves it as a hypothetical to um, to maybe beef that up a little bit and say it will comply with the outcomes of the, the greenhouse gas um, reduction roadmap or in some way, shape or form, recognizing the TIP policy that the greenhouse gas planning standard is has now passed. Yeah, I think we could certainly look at beefing up language. And I actually might refer to Ron, um, just because again, you're, Ron's more familiar with the greenhouse gas rulemaking. And if there's anything specific that we could add in the policy at this time that you're aware of um, without you know, adding in everything necessarily. So I think what this statement is supposed to mean is uh, we're just gonna comply with it without getting into details. Mm -hmm. Ron, would you like to add anything? Sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm reading the language that's in the proposed policy document and just trying to think through what that might look like and what the substantive changes. Alex, do you have a do you have specific language in mind? Um, I I don't have specific verbiage. I guess I it, in my mind what I was trying to get at is something that explicitly recognizes that the planning standard has now passed, as opposed to you know my the way I read the any outcomes is kind of a hypothetical of if it should pass then there will be outcomes. Yeah, I mean I I, I I'm sure I guess I understand the point. the The rulemaking came from. Senate Bill 260, um, I, from a functional standpoint, there's no effect. We know we have to comply with the greenhouse gas rule. And I, so, um, it must also comply with any outcomes. I guess, Alex, I, I prefer the language we have. I think it gives a gives it leaves the language more flexible to any any future changes or rulemaking, um, rather than referring to a specific specific rulemaking now. Um, but I could be if, if the if the TAC feels strongly a different way, we'll we'll take that. The, the question I'd have, Ron, of you and Todd on that um, would be, um, you know, we had the employee trip reduction plan that came about that was, that did go into rules, but that would have been one of those rules that would have, you, you could see another version of that maybe in the future. And so is that the reason you're asking for the flexibility? Not that's, getting that's, that's, that's a great, yeah, that's a great example, Mr. Chair of, of you know, there, there are other things mentioned in the roadmap. There's other things mentioned in 1261 that could result in future rulemaking. And I think having having this language captures all of that without sort of just tying to one particular rulemaking. And then the, also, the, the Alex, does that are you still wanting something more specific? Let me ask that question first, Alex. I guess I, I appreciate the desire to have it be flexible and, and certainly appreciate um, the example of the employee trip reduction program and perhaps that coming back in a different incarnation. I guess I'd, I'm wondering if there's a way that we can leave it be flexible to recognize other things that might come out of that while also explicitly acknowledging that the um, greenhouse gas planning standard has passed and is in force. Um, I, I'm fine, Mr. Chair, if we want to add at the end of that last sentence in um, section three there, um, 
uh, uh, comma in including the and I'll whatever uh, the the transportation give us, you'll give us latitude to cite the specific title of the transportation planning rule the state transportation planning rule does that work alex yes i, I think that would be great okay I, yeah i think alex, it's transportation alex, yeah. rule on yeah. transportation planning or so yeah because the title of the rule actually does i don't think actually includes the greenhouse gas reduction it's the it's the transportation planning rule yeah, right. no, I'm fine referencing whatever the, the official final title of it is. Okay. You, did you have others, Alex? Uh, yes. Um, also on page 32 in the number four capital project eligibility, um, previously capital projects had to be identified in the particular air quality staging period um, to be eligible for regional share funding. And it looks like the draft language has also added and sub-regional share funding, which is different from the previous tip. And I am wondering if we can entertain removing the sub-regional share eligibility um, to provide sub-regions more flexibility in their capital project eligibility for the sub-regional shares for the upcoming tips. Rod, if you'd like to respond. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I think staff staff would recommend retaining the language. We've we've talked about this at several TAC meetings over the last several months. Uh, we we've we we made um, some significant changes to the eligibility language for the subregional share and the regional share based on feedback from the TAC. But fiscal constraint is a is a really important consideration when we're allocating and prioritizing investments in the tip cycle uh, from from the regional transportation plan. So uh, we would we would not recommend agreeing to that change. Alex, I guess I'm curious if others on tech what their thoughts are. Okay. I don't see any other hands raised right now, Alex. We could cut back to that uh, possibly. Okay. Um, yeah. my next one was on page 35. Um, and this relates to spelling out what the um, different acronyms of federal funding can fund. Um, and I know this is just summarizing <clears throat> what projects are eligible. Um, in the STBG, it says the federal funding is the most flexible and can be used for a variety of projects. And then at the end, there's and transit. And I'm wondering, can we specify if that covers transit capital, transit operations, or both? And I know whatever we put here doesn't change what STBG can be used for, but I think in the spirit of illustrating what we can be use it for, I think having that clarified here would be helpful. Uh, certainly, yes, we can. We can expand that. Thank you. Um, and then on page 40, um, which has the, um, I guess the types of projects that could essentially score you air quality points in the STBG round, um, the third sub bullet example project types or any type assuming the element is justified except standalone reconstruction and bridge rehab replace. Um, I would like to advocate for including roadway capacity in the list of project types that are accepted from being able to score you air quality points here, as I do not think that roadway capacity um, ever improves air quality. And I don't think that those project types should be able to score you points in this, um, in this uh, one of the six uh, regional priorities. Um, yes, I think that can be added unless there's other staff that override me. I, um, I get, this is, this is Ron. Um, it, it, I think that, um, there, there could very well be cases where a limited capacity project could have air quality benefits. That's why congestion relieving projects are actually a, an eligible project under the federal, um, CMAQ program. Um, because there can be air quality benefits. And I think um, tying our hands here in this process uh, is, is probably not appropriate. Um, 
the applicant, the project sponsor will have to demonstrate that those benefits actually happen. You don't automatically get those air quality points. You have to demonstrate why and how um, your project will actually improve air quality. Brooke, you looked like you wanted to address this. Yeah, I just I would just point out that uh, I would just to echo what Ron had just said because on our particular tip project uh, for 120, we had, did actually just that. Um, I, I appreciate Alex's point that he believes that it doesn't do anything, but we actually did the analytical analysis, and it actually does improve air quality on our project because of the congestion management relief that it provides. And I think it's a little short sighted to eliminate something that is already part of the uh, scientific requirements of the federal process to demonstrate what Ron had uh, alluded to. So I, I would be opposed to removing that language. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Uh, John, you were you wanting to address that also? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I would echo what he just said. I, I believe that there are, I understand that we may in the past have stretch things a little bit about congestion management and uh, greenhouse gas reduction, but I believe there are projects, as they mentioned, um, where you can eliminate or reduce uh, backups and, and so on that, that should qualify. Thank you. Uh, and I note that Brian agreed with Ron about that in the, in the chat. Alex, uh, thoughts? I guess I disagree, but if that's what's in the, the federal requirements and not hearing any other support, I'll just register my desire to change it, but um, withdraw at this point and move on to the next one, if that's all right. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, on page 43, um, the phase initiation deadline for bus service seems to be written as though RTD would always be the operator. Um, the current deadline language is the IGA executed with RTD and service has begun. And in the era where RTD may or may not be the transit operator for various tip transit operations projects, um, you know, this could be, could be RTD, it could be the local government, um, it could be CDOT, it could be a private contractor. Um, but if it's not RTD, wondering if we can have a change to the bus service deadline um, to recognize transit operations tip projects that might not have anything to do with RTD and wouldn't be executing an IGA with RTD in order to complete their deadline. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see any problem eliminating the with RTD because um, obviously the main point is to have an IGA executed. So some type of agreement and regardless of which agency it's with. So yeah, certainly I'm, I'd be okay with that. So I guess to clarify, are you proposing to just strike the everything before and including the and and just have service has begun or leave IGA executed and service has begun? No, for, there would have to be an IGA executed for the flow of the, the state or federal funds. So, yeah. so, you know, the money would have to flow to somebody who's eligible to get them. And under most cases, that is RTD, but it could be another agency. So there still needs to be an IGA executed and the service to begin to initiate that service. Right. Hey, Todd, would it be okay if it said something like IGA executed with RTD or other service provider and service has begun? Yeah. Yeah, that would be perfectly fine. As long as we don't eliminate the IGA executed part. Alex, are you okay with that? I guess I'm still a little confused on is the IGA being executed with whoever's providing the funding or is the IGA being executed with whoever's operating the service? With whoever's providing the funding. So mo it's in most cases, it is CDOT or RTD. Um, there are some agencies that are eligible to be designated recipients. So it could technically be them. Um, but if you were to begin a bus service project, uh, you would have to execute an IGA with somebody who has the funding. Basically, who do you submit your billings to? Mm -hmm. And that is outside of who is running the service. 
I think I think that makes sense. Um, then moving on to the next one on page 46, I'm not 100% sure, but I think in the safety, active transportation and freight categories, there might be a typo about the staging periods um, in the any project phase column, um, starting with the arterial safety, regional vision zero, there's listed projects in the 2020 through 2039 staging period, um, but those Correct. two staging periods. So yep. Either there's a missing S or one of the twos or the threes is wrong, but I'm not sure which is the intent. Yes, within arterial safety region vision zero, it should say 2020 to 2029 instead of 39. Okay. Yep. Thank you for pointing that out. And then I think on page 50 for the sub regional eligibility that same typo exists for the safety active transportation and freight categories yep thank you for pointing that out that's what see that's what happens when you copy and paste <laughs> <laughs> i'll make those corrections um and then my last comment thanks to you to everyone for bearing with me um on page 52 there's a table uh, showing how many sub-regional applications Dr. Cog staff um, would review for the sub-regional rounds if that was desired by the sub-regions. And for my example, um, Boulder County, uh, um, Dr. Cog staff will review up to 15 applications. Let's say that we have our first sub-regional call for projects and we get 16 applications. Is there any guidance on how we should determine which 15 of the 16 Dr. Cog would review and how to keep that fair to the one that was not reviewed by Dr. Cog staff? <laughs> right. So, so let's go back four years when we were developing this policy. Um, we put in these numbers without actually knowing um, because we, again, hadn't had the knowledge. Um, so they were just estimates based on the amount of funding. Um, there was only one form that took advantage of that um, four years ago. And quite frankly, that wasn't something that we really considered that most forums would probably take advantage of. Um, so you're probably right. There, what happens if that does take place? Um, and I... I I don't know the real, I guess I don't really know the real answer. Uh, but certainly I think if in your example, there was 16 or 17 when we said the max was 15, I don't think that would be the issue. I think what we were trying to get at is to make sure that forums were not taking advantage of just Dr. Cog staff scoring them versus the subregions. Mm. Um, but I think we could certainly add something in. Um, some text in that may reflect that. Um, do, do some thinking exactly how that language would fit in. I guess I, I can understand why, you know, let's say that we had 30 applications for the Boulder County Forum, that that's, we're well exceeding our uh, limit. But if we had 16, can we ask nicely and then Dr. Cog staff will review one additional one and, you know, wondering how to, enshrine any flexibility in the TIP policy here. Uh, let me ask this from a staff perspective. Would everyone be okay from changing this instead of to say maximum number to say approximate number? Ron, did you want to respond? I I don't know if I have a I don't know if I have a great answer. It's an interesting question. I, I hate to come up. We, we're not going to be able to come up with numbers here. Maybe there's just a sentence added uh, right after the table um, that we can that if if TAC will give Todd and Todd and me some latitude to come up with the the concept of the language would be to say that. Um, at the request of a subregion, Dr. Cog um, staff may consider um, uh, review or scoring of, uh, of additional projects above these limits within within available uh, staffing resources. 
I think that certainly meets the intent of what I was looking for. So I appreciate that. And personally, I'm happy to give you that latitude. John, did you have comment on that? John Cotton. Only that having sat through those, I don't know what there were, 35 meetings or whatever to come up with this policy. I, you know, I hate to start uh, changing it sort of on the fly. That number, you could pick any number, but we picked a number and there was a reason for it. And, you know, I, I think we start doing that, we open up Pandora's box. Okay, John. Uh, Phil, were you wanting to comment on that? Not that one, but an earlier one, so I can wait. Okay. Art, were you wanting to comment on this one? You know, I think it would be clearer if we just move the whole group, whatever that group is, to 16, than to open the door, you know, to like, oh, you know, 16, then you can submit 17 to 18. And the point is, is for the subregions to pick their best projects. And I think if that number is 15, great. If it's 16, great. Whatever it is, let's hold the number. Um, because, you know, Dr. Cog doesn't have endless staff to review this. And already the subregions have a pretty good idea of what their best projects are. So, I would say hold the line or just increase the number to 16 and move on. But, but the number's the number, you know. Here's four more from Douglas County. I, I just think that's kind of too open-ended, you know. Here's, here's eight more, you know. <laughs> where, where does it stop? So I'd, I'd hold the line, whatever it is. If you want to move up to 16 total, I don't have a problem with that. But then 16 doesn't become 20 or 24, you know. Thanks. Thank you. Did any other have uh, members have comment on on that particular issue? Uh, Brooke? Yeah, I guess I just what are we managing for here? I mean, I understand that there's a there's positive intent, but I'm I'm kind of in following up on what Art just said. You know, I think there this has been a deliberative process, and I don't want to second guess what other effort has already gone into this, and also overlay overload. Dr. Cog staff either, but I guess I'm just trying to, I, I wanna circle back on this on this point to try to understand what ultimately are we trying to accomplish with, with the amended, with the amend, proposed amendment? Alex, do you wanna address that? Uh, yes, my main concern was just fairness to the process where, you know, in my hypothetical example, Boulder County wanted to exercise this option and were allotted 15 applications that Dr. Cog staff would review and we get 16 applications, you know, then how do we choose which one of them doesn't get Dr. Cog staff review and how do we keep the process fair to whichever one we identify that's not going to get the Dr. Cog staff review. So I guess my question is, are you anticipating getting 16 applications? Because I think in a hypothetical world, I would agree, you can pick a number and stick with it. And I think you know, every subregion has that dilemma of having to battle and struggle with what to bring forward when we, when we go through the subregional process. I have absolutely no idea how many applications we'll get. So I guess I would just say then it, it, it doesn't seem likely then that there's a, an impetus to want to or to need to change this as much as it is just a, a desire. And so I would, I would just recommend that we just keep it as is. I know I, I have to echo John's comments about we spent probably a meeting or two on picking those numbers. So um, uh, back when we developed the original T tip and uh, policy that that was this one grew out of the uh, and it was it was uh, based on not overwhelming Dr. Cog staff and that the actually the subregions did the work did a lot of the work before it came to Dr. Cog. Uh, Alex, so that's that's how those numbers were arrived at. 
Okay. It was also based on the do the dollar amount that each sub region uh, sub region um, receives. Mm -hmm. I guess not hearing much other support, I will withdraw this one. And that is the end of my comments. So I appreciate the time and consideration. Thank you for your thorough review on that, Alex. Justin, I believe you're next from Denver. Yes, uh, and actually, so I had my hand up prior to Alex starting, but one of my comments was kind of following up on something Alex had brought up. Um, and yeah. I think, I think oh, this will come back to Todd and or Ron, um, <clears throat> just to confirm what I think I heard. Um, we have eligibility by virtue of the funding source, um, but that's not where the eligibility limits end, correct? Because it, it, it's my understanding what I heard is at the sub-regional level, eligible projects will be those which are included in the fiscally constrained plan. Is that correct? Yes. Or, or within a, or within a um, program category. So my question is a little directed towards. So we're considering a couple of projects on our wait list now. Mm -hmm. Kind of tough, given you know we applied under certain assumptions. The funds offer different solutions. Makes sense for us to wait and maybe blend the funding sources, get the match a little closer to where we were. But I don't know without the list in front of me if we envision moving those projects forward into the first staging period of the, of the RTP. So we would either, if either they're in the list and we can reapply for them, or they have a nexus with a program, or they're not eligible. Is that kind of the three potential opportunities with the next tip? Um, they're, they're called out in there, they, they fit in a program bucket, or we simply can't apply for them. I believe that's, I believe you've stated that correctly. Um, so I would say this, I, I understand the rationale behind um, extending the, the plan and, and you've been very upfront about it, right? Like I, I've heard y'all talking about this, about trying to be more intentional around pulling only from the RTP um, going forward. Um, I would, maybe unpopular, but I would be also in favor of lifting or at least making as to the degree we can that more flexible. And I say it only because um, given, you know, hey, more federal money, wonderful opportunity. It creates more opportunity for our important projects, but um, it may also tighten the screw on us um, in the ability to find ready projects. And, you know, we, we have more projects to fund now with that, with that money available. You know, obviously we've tightened up the phase initiation and time to start. I mean, just with all things kind of closing in, I just don't want that list of delays that has already doubled to drop double again, because we're just constantly shrinking the, the pool of eligible projects with all of these additional layers, some of which are in our control and some of which are not. So just wanted to state my piece on that. Justin, this is Ron, I, I don't, <clears throat> I, I don't see the connection to project delays with what you're what you're saying. Um, so I, I don't I don't quite understand that piece. Yeah, so the first staging period in the RTP contains the programs and projects by which we can pursue tip funding for, correct? Correct. Um, so it limits the pool of projects that we have. And to be fair, there's plenty of projects in there. I don't want to pretend that, you know, we're, our hands are tied and we have nothing. I just want to kind of point out, you know, um, it's the, it, it pushes more pressure and, and understandably you want to get funds moving projects started. Um, I'm, I'm not even saying I'm asking for a change because I think Dr. Cog in this process has been, has not dropped this on us out of nowhere. It just is what it is. I just look at the, um, having more shovel ready projects, um, we're, we're having fewer by virtue of the fact we're starting with a smaller list. Let's put it that way. Um, and shovel readiness then, you know, limits what we have the ability to program and apply for. It. Yeah, Justin, I, I, I certainly, I understand, I understand the point. I guess um, my, my answer would be that one, we're talking about, you know, what, essentially five years worth of funding here, uh, whereas the first staging period of the 10 years is, 
is 10 years worth of, of expected funding. And despite the fact that it feels like we're getting a whole bunch of new money through the infrastructure bill and Senate Bill 260 that, we'll, that we're allocating through the TIP process, um, our financial constraint analysis on the RTP um, included assumptions for, for those funds plus more. Um, so there's, there are more projects in, in the regional transportation plan in that first staging period than we would be able to, to afford to invest in through this, through this tip cycle. And, um, so I think, you know, if considering the fact that the RTP was just adopted earlier this, earlier this spring in 2021, um, I, you know, if you're, if you're saying that, Denver has projects in the second 10 year staging period of their RTP that are more ready to go and higher priorities than projects in the first 10 year staging period. I'd like to understand why that's the case. Um, Cause we were, we were, we were pretty intentional with all of the, all of the um, local agency partners about what the priorities were and, and making sure that those got into the, into the first staging period within the within the financial constraint in partnership with the local sponsors. Yeah, I, I I can't speak to a specific at this time. I'm kind of speaking more to the the idea of flexibility absent any specific examples. And and yes, it is for the reasons you explain, I'm on board with you. But I will also say it's always easier to work with more flexibility than it is with less. Um, and until I encounter any specific examples, I won't have any to give you. Potentially, I won't have any anyway. But um, just making the pitch for um, more flexibility, uh, I understand the reasons why it's taken the direction it has. So that's really, I just wanted to put that out there. Uh, uh, just just one last point, Mr. Chair, if you'll indulge me to to Justin's point and and Alex and Alex too. Also remember that um, we have we have a we have a whole another tip cycle that will start once the RTP review is completed and and we have an updated RTP and there that that solicitation is out there now for proposed changes and so this is if there's a high priority project that um, there's a strong justification and financial constraint ability to move earlier there's a next tip there's a next tip cycle that will be available to um, to seek funding for for that project within the within the 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 next regional and sub-regional share that'll that'll kick off after this first one thank you Ron. justin did you have additional comments or concerns with the of the policy no, and I, I appreciate that, Ron. As always, we're just looking for a pathway to potential options. And if that, a project that, you know, um, maybe we focus in this tip on on what's there. And then if we have something that just absolutely has to move quicker um, because it can and meet these various requirements, then, then you laid out a path to get that amended. So appreciate it. Thank you, Justin, for your comments. Uh, Phil, you had your hand up. Do you have additional items? Yeah, just real quick, just to agree with uh, Justin and, and Alex on this one is, um, and, and Ron, you've answered the, the question. So I, I just wanted to reiterate that when we were told about staging periods and those being applied to regional projects, we were told that, well, you have your sub-regional share that you can fall back on if you have to go outside those staging periods. So to see the sub-regional piece in this now is, is it's kind of tough, but I appreciate the, the answer and that we can work to another tip. But I just want to let you know that that's something we kind of thought going forward was going to be available to us uh, for some projects that weren't necessarily in that staging period that we weren't going to go then after regional share. We were going to go after sub-regional share, but now to see sub-regional folded into that same category or that same spending limitation is kind of difficult at this time. So just wanted to reiterate that and pass that along. Thank you for the comment, Phil. Any other uh, comments or thoughts um, on the uh, on the item before us? If so, please raise your hand. Otherwise, I would uh, would uh, entertain a uh, motion. And Todd, could you throw up the motion again, just so that they would have it? 
There we go. Brooke, go ahead. So move. Okay. So, and is it with the additional comments that were agreed upon? Yeah, as as amended uh, per the conversation here today. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Brooke. Is there a second? Please raise your hand. Art, right. I think you're up. I'll second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor of the motion uh, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed signify by saying no. I hear I, I hear no no's and then any abstentions. Motion passed. Thank you. Our uh, next item is to is uh, uh, it's time to elect a new chair and vice chair for the 2022-2023 term. And um, I'll have Jacob uh, Ruger make an introduction uh, to this item. Go ahead, Jacob. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Tosh and Cam, for bringing up the item. So just wanted to talk about the process of how we got here and what next steps are to conduct the election for um, our chair and vice chair for the next two-year term. So these folks will serve in 2022 and 2023. Um, so first, I want to start by thanking both everyone who expressed interest in being a candidate uh, for either the chair or vice chair position. Uh, we did have several candidates as well as the nominating panel that um, kind of helped staff kind of work through um, the, the interest of candidates and come to the recommendation that you see before you today. Um, so I want to thank the nominating panel, Rick Pilgrim, Bill Saroy, David Gaspers, and Alex Hyde-Wright uh, for spending some time to work on that over the last month. So as you all remember at the November, uh, November TAC meeting, uh, we said we would do a solicitation uh, for interest, interested candidates in these positions. And that's also the, the time that we formed the nominating committee. Uh, we then sent out that solicitation inviting anyone to, you know, members, um, the TAC members to run, uh, to express interest in running for either chair or vice chair. Um, and then we also, um, per direction from the nominating panel, uh, reached out to several folks to, to sort of gauge their interest. Um, again, through all of those means, we did get several candidates. Um, and then the primary function of the nominating panel was to talk through um, those candidates and to come up with the recommended slate um, that you see here today. So based on, based on the deliberations of the nominating panel, the panel is recommending for chair, uh, Steve Durian of Jefferson County, and for vice chair, Sarah Grant from the city and county of Broomfield. So in a moment, I'm going to turn it back to the chair to actually run, our current chair, to run the election. Um, nominations will be allowed from the floor if you want to self-nominate or you want to nominate somebody else um, that will be allowed. Um, based, based on the number of, um, if we have more than the recommended slate of candidates, so in other words, if we do have multiple nominations uh, for either position, we'll do chair first and then vice chair. Um, if we do end up having multiple candidates, um, that will change the way that we conduct the voting, um, and the chair will explain that. Um, but with that, um, I would invite anyone from the nominating panel if you'd like to supplement my comments on this process. Otherwise, I will turn it back to the chair uh, to run the election. Would any members from the uh, nominating panel like to add any supplemental information that Jacob's presented? If so, please raise your hand. I do not see any hands raised. I do thank the nominating committee for their work. Um, at this time, I'd open the floor for um, nominations for chair. Any additional nominations for chair? So please raise your hand. I do not see any hands raised. Uh, any not additional nominations for vice chair, please raise your hand. And Mr. Chair, if I may, while, while you're soliciting candidates, uh, one other clarification on this election, regardless of which method we need to use, um, folks who are eligible to vote, and it says this in the memo, is TAC members who are here today and TAC alternates who are representing their members who are not here today. So if you are a TAC alternate, 
um, and your member is here, you are not eligible to vote. But if you're an alternate and you are not here, your member is not here, you are eligible to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the reminder, Jacob. I do not see any hands uh, raised. Uh, Phil, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to move to elect Steve Durian as chair and Sarah Grant as vice chair to the Transportation Advisory Board for the 2022-2023 term. Thank you. Would you amend that to say nomination sees and, and accept the nomination committee's recommendations for chair and vice chair? I, I would. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a second? Uh, Art? Yes, I would second that motion. And we know that we can't retain you, Kent, but we want to all express an excellent job. So hopefully we have time to honor you on that here down the road. But I do second the um, motion as you stated it, Kent. Okay. You're here. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Um, we will, uh, it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations to uh, Steve and Sarah. And Mr. Chair, if, if I may. Yes, you may. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Kent knows what's coming, but I did want to take an opportunity on behalf of Dr. Cog's staff to express our sincere appreciation for everything Kent has done for us um, as chair the last two years. He's been an exemplary chair to work with um, just generally, but in particular, um, Kent had to deal with something that no other chair has ever had to deal with, which was you know, three months into his term, um, converting to quarantine and working from home in the pandemic and how that changed the way that we ran these meetings. Um, and he's just been a wonderful partner to us in, in sort of riding with us and in, in sort of dealing with the curveballs thrown at us by the world and keeping us on track in terms of these TAC meetings. So once again, I really just wanna express staff's appreciation for um, the work that Ken has done as chair and um, the work that Steve Durian has done as vice chair as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. I'll have a few more comments at the end of the meeting, but right now let's move on to uh, informational briefings and uh, the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Revision Kickoff. And Jacob, I believe you're uh, doing this presentation. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, don't have a PowerPoint today. I actually wanted to do this a little bit differently, but as has already been mentioned in this meeting, um, did want to talk about the upcoming revision to the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan um, and sort of, you know, what that process we think is going to start um, looking like. Um, and Cam and Josh, I wonder if you could make the memo just a little bit larger for folks to be able to see on the screen. If you can, thank you very much. So what I want to do is just talk through some key points and then where I really want to spend most of the time is kind of walking you through um, the schedule that we attach to this item, which is, of course, a very sort of big and detailed schedule, but want to give you a sense of what we're trying to communicate. Um, so first, as Ron already alluded to, the greenhouse gas rulemaking was adopted um, by the Transportation Commission last week. Um, it will go into effect in February. Obviously, we're already planning ahead in terms of the requirements that it will place on us. Uh, the big requirement for the context of this agenda item as it relates to the 2050 RTP is that we need to revise um, or sort of update the 2050 RTP by October 1st of 2022. In specific, we need to demonstrate that the 2050 RTP as revised will meet the emission reduction targets that are now contained um, in the final rule. So this is not a project-based analysis, but it is a plan-based analysis. We need to demonstrate that the plan as a whole for the Dr. Cog region will meet those emission reduction targets. Um, and we need to, doc to document that. Um, by, um, again, October 1st of 2022. Um, as has already been alluded to, as part of this process, since we're going back into the plan anyway, uh, we're also taking this opportunity because we didn't do it, obviously, during the 2050 RTP development. As many of you will remember, in between major plan updates, we did what we called a typical sort of cycle amendment process. That was you know, typically once a year, sometimes twice a year process um, that we would allow folks to, uh, project sponsors to suggest um, or request project-based amendments to the plan. Um, so all of you should have received a solicitation from me um, on December 4th, 15th, um, so last, last week. 
um, inviting um, project-based amendments to the plan if needed, and to clarify what we're looking for there. Again, since we just adopted the plan in April, we're not anticipating or expecting a lot of changes to the plan, but knowing that projects change over time, many projects are going through the federal project development process, the NEPA process. Over time, of course, things do change about project scope, uh, maybe staging period, maybe the cost of a project. So if there's something about a project in the fiscally constrained plan, um, you know, that really does need to change in 2022, um, that's what we're looking for in this amendment cycle. So what we're going to do is we're gonna take what we hear um, through those requested amendments and those are due uh, January 14th. Um, and then we'll report to you back in January kind of what we heard from folks. Um, so we're going to take that as well as the GHG revision work and kind of, you know, proceed through in terms of any needed updates to the 2050 RTP as we get into 2022. Um, and in a second, we'll look at the schedule. Um, but I also want to make clear that it's not just Dr. Cog in this process. I mean, of course, it's all of us, as it always is. But in particular, um, CDOT is also doing a strategic sort of review of its 10-year plan. Um, CDOT will be starting its 4P uh, process early next year. We've been coordinating closely with CDOT. Uh, we want to do those things together. Um, and frankly, you know, what's in the 10-year plan is also reflected in the 2050 RTP and the GHG emission reduction requirements that come with that. Um, so those processes will be linked and coordinated very closely together. Um, and I'll invite CDOT staff to kind of pitch in on this as well. Um, but Joshua Cam, if you could scroll down to the schedule, um, let's take a look at that. And again, it's a really detailed schedule. Yeah, sorry, give us just a second here. Yeah, I'd scroll back down and then if we could click on the link to pull that up. So give us just a second here. What I'll say as we're pulling up the schedule is not gonna go through every, every sort of you know, box or cell in the schedule and hopefully it will pull up. There we go. And then we'll blow this up here. Thank you, great. Is that somewhat readable to folks? Okay, yep. so again, not gonna go through every line of this, but I just wanna give you a broad sense of kind of what we're looking, looking at here in terms of the schedule. So we've scoped out kind of what it would take from, we really kind of started this end of November, beginning of December through um, September to do the work that we think will be, um, we think will be part of this process. And I will say up front that this is a new process for us. We've never done something quite like this before. Um, some of you have seen a version of this at the county transportation forum meetings that have been held in December, where I gave an overview of this. And there were some really good questions around, you know, what does this mean? What is the scope of this? And truthfully, we don't know yet. Um, what it will entail is to do an analysis of the existing 2050 regional transportation plan that's specified in the GHG rulemaking is sort of that starting point, that baseline of where we at in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions. And then that will give us a sense of what is, you know, what is our ability to meet the emission reduction targets. And there are several of them between now and 2050 that are specified in, um, in the GHG rulemaking. So it could be, probably won't be a super simple process, but it could be relatively straightforward or it could be relatively complicated. Because we don't know what we built into the schedule here, um, and camera, Josh, if you could scroll down just a little bit. As we get into the schedule, kind of the, yeah, stay on the left side, thank you. Um, what you see here is it says conduct several rounds, you know, first round, second round, essentially third round of GHG analysis. We're allowing up to three rounds of this type of analysis if they're needed, and we, we won't know yet if they're needed, but we're trying to build in plenty of time over the spring on this schedule to kind of go through that iterative, you know, we, we run the model, we do the analysis, what does it tell us? How close are we? What more do we need to do? You know, we do that the first round, maybe we need to do a second round, maybe we even need to do a third round. Um, so that's what we're trying to build in here. What we hope to do, to be frank, is be able to use the tools that we have, the tools in our toolbox in the sense of the investments that we already have in our regional transportation plan, both the fiscally constrained projects as well as the programs. Um, that we've talked about that represent a significant amount of financial investments in the types of, of projects and, and categories um, that should help us 
you know, meet the emission reduction targets. So the first thing is to kind of look to what we already have in the plan and see how close that gets us. We also have tools in our toolbox in terms of modeling, some things that we can do with our regional traffic model to kind of simulate or model some things that maybe they're not, you know, fiscally constrained projects that are already directly modeled in the plan, um, but investments or categories or things, you know, to use cliches, you know, levers or dials in the model um, that we can use that would help us get there um, to simulate some of the things that we know are happening in the real world or that we're invested in, in the real world that would help us meet our emission reduction targets. So those are kind of our two, you know, our first two sort of um, things that we look towards. Um, you know, then as we sort of go down that hierarchy, you know, eventually we may need to get to the point of looking at the project mix in the plan. I do want to be clear that that's not our first option. Uh, we're not intending to redo the fiscally constrained plan. We're not intending to redo the financial plan, as Ron indicated. The financial plan already, you know, sort of, uh, you know, encompasses everything we've been talking about today. But everything has to be on the table. So the most complex, you know, sort of piece of this could potentially be if we have to, you know, look at something in the project mix in the plan. Um, and then probably sort of the final thing is in the GHG rulemaking, um, there's something called GHG mitigations. Uh, we're actually working with CDOT and other stakeholders around the state to sort of define what those mitigation measures are. Um, we hope to not have to use them because we hope we've already built them into uh, the work that we've done in the plan and in the model and the other tools that we have. But in sort of a, I hate to call it worst case scenario, um, but in the most complex case scenario, if we needed to take advantage of these quote unquote mitigation measures that aren't otherwise incorporated in any of the other tools in our toolbox, we can do that. Um, but that comes with a requirement in the rulemaking that we would then need to prepare something called the um, mitigation action plan um, and submit that as part of um, our documentation of the RISE 2050 RTP. So as we go down this list, once we go through the however many iterations we need on this analysis, um, Cam and Josh, if you could scroll down a little bit. Yeah, that works. Then we get into, by this point, we're in spring and summer of 2022. We still have all of our typical federal requirements, fiscal constraint, um, air quality conformity analysis, the things that we always done, have done every time we've amended or updated the, the regional transportation plan. Uh, we need to do those things as well. And then really this is getting us positioned towards um, getting the documentation together by about early summer, um, the revised 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, um, something in the GHG rulemaking that's called uh, GHG Transportation Report, which is on the lower left. And then, as I said, if we need it as well, the Mitigation Action Plan, those documents need to be reviewed by the state, uh, the Air Quality Control Commission, the um, Air Pollution Control Division, and the Transportation Commission. And then um, layering on top of all of that is our typical sort of, um, you know, public and stakeholder review process, our 30 day public comment period, our public hearing in front of our board, um, you know, some of the work that we're going to do that we started with our 2015 RTB in terms of things like our citizens advisory committee. Um, and some of the public techniques that we did before that we want to carry forward, all of which would bring us to uh, camera Josh if you'll slide the schedule over on the right. If you can, um, when we get to these sort of uh, blue and green bars down here, um, this is really sort of August um, of uh, 2022 is when we're this schedule is sort of aiming to have our board um, actually take action on the revised uh, 2050 regional transportation plan with September um, as a backup in case we need that time again, so that we can be complete with this process and submit the revised plan by October 1st of 2022. So there's much more detail in this schedule in terms of specific steps. Um, and then at the bottom of the schedule, we've outlined some meetings, both internal and external, really just to be transparent. I'm not gonna go through all of these now, but we're trying to lay out um, sort of the sequence of meetings, committee updates to you all, to the board, um, AQCC, the Transportation Commission, other folks that we would work with so that uh, we can be transparent and you can have a sense of how this process might flow. But I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, I would like to invite anyone from CDOT to kind of chime in uh, from their perspective on their 4P process and 10-year plan update process, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Jacob. Anyone from CDOT like to, to chime in on their process that Jacob um, on their 4P and 10-year? Uh, if so, please raise your hand. Jessica, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't raise my hand. I just unmuted. That's all right. <laughs> That's okay. So Danny, do you want to, I think Danny's on the line. I don't know if he can speak or not, but 
He um, has been working really hard with our leadership to develop our 4P kind of invitation letters. And so I believe those went out to our constituents um, last Friday. So the letters indicated, you know, we're starting to work on our 4P process. We're working really hard to align that with everything going on with Dr. Cog. So I think what we would ask is um, <clears throat> that you work uh, within the deadlines that Danny gave. We're looking to have some 4P meetings with you, um, you know, early in the winter season. And he was requesting dates by January 14th. So if you have any questions on the letters, the, they came out via email and just inviting you all to start kind of thinking about that 4P process and kind of the steps that we have coming forward. Yeah, yeah thanks. Mr. Chair. Oh, sorry, Danny, go ahead. Oh, that's right. I was just gonna add that, um, you know, we sent those emails to the subregion technical chairs um, so if you haven't seen those yet, they just went out last week, but I guess a couple points of note, we'll be doing our normal 4P and at the 4P, which will take place, you know, in, I think we said March, April, um, early May is when we're trying to schedule those. But we did also highlight that if you know of any potential changes your subregion would like to request of the 10-year plan that may involve a change to the RTP, we need to know that um, by January to fit in with the schedule Jacob was giving as well. So, you know, if your subregion has decided we have, you have a project that's no longer a priority that you may want to come off our list, you know, we don't have a lot of money. We're not looking to add a lot of projects. Um, but if if there is anything, and, and we're hoping there won't be, we know we just did this recently, but if there are any of those changes, we'll need to hear from your subregion by that same January 14th deadline so that we have time to review it and get it submitted to Jacob to handle any of those changes within the RTP. Otherwise, we'll come back and we'll still discuss the prioritization and everything else of, of the plan when we do our 4P meetings in the spring, but just kind of wanted to highlight that deadline. Thank you, uh, Danny and Jessica and uh, Jacob. Any specific questions for any of the three? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, if, if I could, while we're while you're soliciting questions, I appreciate Danny's points and Jessica's as well. And just to just to sort of tag on to that, in both Dr. Cog's process and CDOT's process, you know, we do envision using um, communicating with and using the um, County Transportation Forms. Again, for those of you that have already met, you know that already because we've talked about um, kind of schedule and expectations for 2022. But I just want to make that point for the forms that haven't met yet. Um, that, you know, obviously for the tip, you know, you'll need to meet frequently, but we want to communicate with you as well. And we've been working closely with CDOT to coordinate these two processes. And really the bottom line point for both agencies is that we want to work with you and we want to learn things together as soon as we can, you know, in the winter and early spring of 2022, um, to the extent that any changes, you know, affect either the 2050 RTP or the 10 year plan. So we'll be working together as agencies, but we'll be working with you through the forum process to have those conversations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. I see no hands raised, so I thank all three of you for your presentation. Uh, in your packet, an informational item, and I'll leave that to uh, your uh, personal uh, reading, um, unless, Todd, you just really want to speak to it. And Todd's being awful quiet, so I assume he sees it as an informational <laughs> item also. <laughs> Um, no, Mr. Chair, I, I think it kind of speaks for itself there. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, I'd call on Carson uh, if you have any AMP working group updates. Uh, sure, Mr. Chair. I have a brief one, if that's all right. That's fine. We met a couple of weeks ago earlier in December and heard presentations from CDOT regarding the Federal Infrastructure Act that we briefly talked about here today. And those projected allocations at the time. We also heard from RTD regarding their restarted reimagine RTD effort and some updates there. Uh, the data and da data sharing sub working group of the AMP recapped the recently completed workshop that they held. Um, and I think that is all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members uh, that like to make comment? Uh, please raise your hand or other matters to come before us. I see no hands raised. I do uh, ask you to please note the 2022 TAC meeting schedule uh, in the packet. And uh, 
As I understand, the meetings will continue as virtual until further notice. Um, our next uh, TAC meeting is January 24th, and I look forward to participating as a member under the new leadership that we just elected today. And I just want to say it's been an honor to serve as chair of TAC, and I would like to thank each of you for your support, flexibility, and guidance to me over the past two years. And while we have not met in person for most of the time, I credit and thank you and Dr. Cog's staff for being able to transition to the virtual meetings, keeping the business of improving transportation in the Dr. Cog region moving forward and successfully implementing the new TIP process and related projects. With that, we are now adjourned. Goodbye, everybody, and I'll see you next month as a member. Thank you, Kent. Thank you. Merry Thank Christmas, you, Happy New Year. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Kent. Happy holidays, guys.